Okay, so pick back up where we left off before lunch uh, here in chapter nine. We talked about different contract statuses and what is required to have an enforceable contract. So now let's talk about when we have an enforceable contract. When is this contract going to be a contract? That moment is really important. When the promises have become legally enforceable is a really important moment. Otherwise known as when are we under contract? That's the way we say that. Are we under contract yet or are we not under contract? For test taking purposes, this is a major test taking topic. You're going to get several questions that are centered around the, the question of do we have a contract at all? And if so, when did it become a contract? We call that process offer and acceptance. So here's the thing. Offers are one-sided. An offer is made by an offer E to an offer what? Or. or. The person making the offer is called the offer E. The person receiving the offer is called the offer. The person making the offer is called the offer or the person making receiving the offer is called the offer E. My brain is not functioning today. So that's what happens when you're thinking about what you're going to say next rather than what you actually say. Can those roles flip? Can the offer or become the offer E? Yes. Absolutely. Now, in a traditional buyer-seller relationship, who's going to be the offer or? Who's making the offer? The buyer is, at least initially. It's the buyer who makes the offer. That's usually the setup. Buyer makes the offer, offer or. Seller receives the offer, offer E. Now, very often that offer is not just accepted outright. What do we end up with? What do we call that when somebody responds without accepting? What are they doing? Making a what? A counter offer. They're making a counter offer. Well, one of the things you should understand about a counter offer is that it really it, it just switches the roles. Because what it does is creates a whole new offer. It rejects the original offer and creates a whole new offer from scratch. When you make a counter offer, you're saying, no, I don't accept your offer, but I'm making you an offer in return. Does that make sense about a counter offer? So that flip-flops the roles. If originally Trudy is the buyer, offer or, and she makes an offer to Bud to purchase his property, so he's the offeree, but then he says, no, I don't like your price, but I'll counter offer with this. Who is now the offer or? The seller or the buyer? The seller. The seller is now the offer or, and the buyer becomes the offeree. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Offer is done by the offer or. Acceptance is done by the offer e. The offer or makes an offer. The offer e accepts. An offer. Does that make sense? Everybody follow me on that? Okay, now, acceptance is a word we need to define. Because here's the thing you can't get to make up your own definition. You don't get to say, you know, oh, uh, acceptance is this. No, acceptance has a very real, legal, definite definition. Acceptance is, who do we say does the acceptance? Offer or offer aid? Offer E. Offer E signs. That is acceptance. Acceptance is signature. I cannot verbally accept an offer on a sales contract. Does that make sense? Because acceptance is what? Signing. You can't verbally sign something. The acceptance is the signing. When people, that's a big misnomer we have when we're communicating offers back and forth. We all the time say, my clients have accepted your offer. Legally, what did you just communicate? That your clients have done what? They signed it. If that's not the case, you just misrepresented. Does that make sense? 
Don't ever say to another real estate broker, my clients have accepted your client's offer unless your clients have accepted that offer, which means they have what? Signed it. Because acceptance is signing. Is, that, is everybody with me on that? Okay? Because that's going to be really important to the idea of when we're actually under a contract. It says a contract is formed at the moment we have something called communication of acceptance. Notice it does not say the contract is formed at acceptance. What did we say acceptance was? Sign. Sign. That's not when we're under contract. We are, let me repeat that. Signed, we're not under contract yet. And here's why. When Trudy makes that offer to Bud, She's the offer or he's the offeree. Does everybody agree with me on that? He accepts it, which means he does what? He signs. he signs it. The problem is that Trudy does not know he has signed it. We can't be under contract without her knowledge. She can't be bound to that contract without knowing she's bound to that contract. So we got one more step that has to be accomplished in order to put us under contract. Is everybody with me? We call that next step communication of acceptance. So yes, we need the communication, but we're still not at the finish line. To create a binding contract in North Carolina, we have to go one step <laughs> further and have communication of acceptance. So when we have nobody but Trudy and Bud involved, what would Bud have to do in order to put Trudy under contract? If he want, he signed it, but what does he have to do? She has to receive it. He has to communicate some form of communication. And here's the thing, it does not matter what form of communication that is. He can call her and say, I've done what? I've signed. I've signed, or what's another way of saying that? I've accepted your offer. Boom, right there. As soon as those words come out of his mouth, what do we have? Contract. Could he email her back a signed copy? Yes. That would be communication of acceptance. Could he send her a fax? Yes. If he can find a fax machine, yes. Could he send smoke signals? Yes. yes. Uh, telegraph, right? My, 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 my granddad's favorite, well not his favorite, but one of his famous uh, little quips was, you know, the three fastest ways to get news out was telegraph, telephone, or tell a woman. You know, that was the, <laughs> the three fastest ways to spread news, you know? So, you gotta love something like yeah. that, right? <laughs> so, communication of acceptance is the important point in time. It's not the acceptance itself. Because here's the thing. Let me go back to this very basic example because we want to make this more complex because we haven't added brokers into the picture. But you need to understand it just from buyer and seller perspective and then we can add the brokers into the picture. If Trudy makes the offer to Bud, offer or offeree, offeree signs, accepts it. He calls her. Now what is he calling her to do? Tell her what? I accept your offer. I accept your offer. She sees her phone ringing. She looks at the caller ID. She's like, oh, this is that guy selling the house. I better tell him I changed my mind. And so she picks up and she says, Hey, bud, I'm just about ready to call you. Um, I've changed my mind. I want to pull my offer off the table. Can she do that? Yes. Yes. She can. You haven't yet communicated to her that she's under contract. You were calling to do such. She saw your name on the caller ID. And when she picked up the phone, she said, hey, I was just getting ready to call you because I wanted to pull my offer off the table. Can she do that? Yes. Absolutely, because we don't have a binding contract yet because we never had what? Communication of the acceptance. It's going to be all about who got the words in first. Because the thing with offers is that offers can always be taken. Some people will say, when can an offer be taken off the table? The answer is always. If it's an offer, when can it not be taken back? When it's a contract. Can't be taken back unless it's a contract. Yes, ma'am. Um, so um, if he had, say, emailed her prior mm -hmm. to that, and he was like, well, I was just calling to tell you that I just emailed you. Yeah. To let you know. Yeah, so I mean, that, that predates her saying that. that any so we have what? We have a contract. 
if he if, so if he had sent a let's say he sent a text message and, and she didn't even seen it he sent her a text message and the you ever have that person that sends you a text email calls you all at the same time yes I'm like, holy crap i mean you give me a chance to just respond oh i emailed and text you yeah while you were calling me holy crap which you know like pitch one but so, you know, so say he sends a text and the minute he sits his sin he thinks i better call her and so he picks up the phone and he calls her and she sees it's him on the caller ID. She sees the text message notification, but she hasn't read the text. And she says, I want to pull my offer off the table. She can't. Because he's already done what? He's communicated. He has sent that communication to her saying that we are what? Under contract. With a time stamp. And it's time stamped, and it clearly predates her telling him that her offer's off. Does that make sense? And so it's going to be all about who gets this in first. Now, obviously, you don't ever want to be caught in a dispute about who was first in something like this, so it's going to be better to use verifiable forms of communication. Yeah, I said the telephone's okay, and I said smoke signals work, but what's going to be the best way to do this? Yeah. Email. Because email's going to have a very definitive time stamp about when that communication happened. And notice I said it didn't even matter if she had not what? It didn't matter if she hadn't read it. It's not about when she sees it. It's about when the communication. It doesn't say receipt of communication. It says what? Communication. It's about when the communication happens. And so the way you think of a contract, and I like to use the classroom sort of as a visual teaching tool, a, the contract has a divide between the buyer and the seller. There are two sides to the contract. Does that make sense? And that offer has to make two trips across that divide without any changes being made before it's a contract. <coughs> Number one, offeror has to send it across the divide to who? Offeree. Offeree. And offeree has to do what? Accept it with no changes, none, and send it back across and say, we're now under contract. You've got to go twice. Does that make sense? And here's the thing. If he makes a change, what does that do to the whole process? Starts, starts it over, flips the roll, starts from scratch. Offer or an offer or flip. So now, let's say, I'll use two different buyers and sellers here. Let's say Omar is selling his property. Okay? Do you try? And Omar, or oh, he's got his property on the market. You tried to make him an offer. So she's the offeror, and he's the what? Offeree. Offeree. She makes an offer to purchase. He looks at it, he likes everything about it, except the closing day is the day before his birthday. And he's planning to be out of town. So he wants to move the closing date back by two days. Not a big change, right? So he puts one line through the closing day, changes it to two days earlier, and initials that change. What did he just do? He restarted. He created a what? A counteroffer. So what did he first do? He rejected her offer. So now when he sends that back and he signed it, he's not signing as the offeree. He's signing as the what? Offer or. And it goes back to you, child. And now we need her to do what? Sign it and send it back, or at least communicate back. She doesn't actually have to send the document back, but she needs to somehow communicate to Omar that she has done what? That she has signed it, that she has accepted it. Because that's what's going to put it under contract. Does that make sense? Now, let me, let me add something into the fold here, because it's something that throws brokers for a loop all the time, and I really wish it would. Did I say anything in there about needing to exchange money in order to be under contract? No. We got real estate brokers right now whose clients will accept an offer and then the next day they'll try to accept a different offer that came in and claim, well, we weren't under contract because you hadn't paid your earnest money yet. What part of communication of acceptance is not sinking in there, right? Because once you've communicated acceptance, are you under contract? Absolutely. Now, if somebody, like a seller, didn't want to accept a contract until they had the earnest money in hand, what should they do? 
Well, it's already in the contract. It say, the, the contract says you're going to pay the earnest money. So how do you prevent it? Don't accept it until what? Until you get the earnest money. Couldn't you call the offer or back and say, listen, we're in agreement with your terms, but we're not going to accept them until we have the earnest money check in our hand. So until then, we're still considering other offers. Get us the earnest money check. Wouldn't that be the more appropriate response? Hold them to it. Because once you sign, you're under contract. Once you sign and communicate with that, you're under contract. Does that make sense to everybody? That is the idea of offer and acceptance. Keep in mind, really important to remember that offers can always be taken back. But once they become a contract, they cannot. Offers can go back, contracts don't. Okay? Everybody good on that? We're going to talk more about uh, offer and acceptance more in detail uh, in chapter 10. We get into much more detail about this idea of offer and acceptance. But I want to keep it simple right now just between a buyer and a seller. Do you think adding brokers to the picture is going to make that a little bit more complex? Yes. It does. It absolutely does. But if you get the basic idea up front, then we come back and add brokers to the mix, hopefully that will make a little bit more sense. All right? Just remember, the, the transaction, the contract is two different opposing sides. So remember, there's a division between them, and it's all about crossing that divide and then going back without making any changes. That's when we have a contract. Um, we, we talked about the statute of frauds in detail. We already talked about it earlier this morning in this chapter. Just a reminder, because you're probably going to see it as not just one, but two or three te test questions. Real estate sales contracts in North Carolina are covered by the North Carolina statute of frauds. That means a real estate sales contract in North Carolina is only enforceable if it is what? In writing. in writing. You can have an oral agreement, but it's not going to be what? It's not going to be enforceable in court of law. So at bare minimum, it must be in writing if you want a court of law to enforce it. Now, what we haven't talked about before is this thing called the parole evidence rule. Well, we have talked about it, we just haven't named it yet. Remember in Chapter 7, we talked about the fact that if you had an agency agreement with a buyer that was oral and they had not given you permission for dual agency, you could just have a conversation with them and get their oral permission for dual agency. And the reason you could just get their oral permission for dual agency was because your buyer agreement was what? Oral. Was oral. But if you have a written buyer agency agreement, what kind of permission do you need for dual agency? You need written agreement. The legal name for that is called the parole evidence rule. The parole evidence rule. Simply, it's very simple. It says on any legal document, written language always takes higher precedence over oral agreements. So another way to look at that is if you have one thing that's oral and one thing that's in writing, which one are you going to follow always? Right. Writing. So if you have a written by our agency agreement that says no dual agency, they can't give you oral permission because we wouldn't follow the oral permission. Which one will we follow? Really? What's in writing. So the only way they can change their mind is to do what? Put it in writing. Go back and change that written agreement. Same thing is true with sales contracts. Are there going to be things that get renegotiated after we're under contract? Absolutely. Things like repairs, for example. If the sales contract itself has to be in writing to be enforceable, what do you think the changes to that contract have to be? In writing. They have to be in writing. That's the parole evidence rule. It says once you've gone to writing, to writing written agreements, you cannot change them unless you change them in writing. There's no, there, it's not enforceable. Can you have a conversation about, well, Okay, we're going to agree to fix the debt. Can you have that conversation? Sure, but it's not enforceable until you do what? Put it in writing. Put it in writing. Everybody all right with that? That's the parole evidence rule. Some other concepts that come up in um, contract law. This phrase, time is of the essence. I almost used it earlier and I realized we hadn't talked about it yet, so I refrained. Um, but uh, Christine's question earlier was, about a delay in closing. And I said, well, if the contract said 
you had to close on a certain day would have delayed the breach. And what was the answer? Yes. This phrase is how the contract would say you have to close on a certain day or you have to do something on a certain day. When a contract means for a date to be very specific, it will have this phrase, time is of the essence, show up behind that date. Otherwise, the way contract law works is that dates and contracts are meant to be targets, not hard and fast rules. So you can't go to court and sue somebody and say, Your Honor, they promised to close on April 12th and it's April 14th and we haven't closed. Unless the contract says what behind that April 12th closing date? Time is of the essence. Because court of law is going to look at that and say, Well, you know what? They pretty much did what they promised to do. If you had meant for this date to be specific, you should have placed the language time is of the essence behind that date. Does everybody follow on that? So when you see this phrase in a contract, it means that that date is very serious. It means that any missing of that date is a breach in the contract. doesn't matter what, what that date refers to or what it's used to refer to, but that date becomes very important. We all good on this language. Okay? You need to know what difference between a novation and an assignment. Novation and assignment. These are changes that happen after we're already under contract. We've got a contract. And we want to change somehow the terms of the contract. We're either going to be dealing with a novation an assignment or an amendment. Well, the, if one or two, if one thing is changing about the contract, we're probably going to use something called an amendment. An amendment is used to change very isolated things. So if we were going to change the purchase price from $200,000 to $202,000, we would probably use what document to make that change? An amendment. We would amend the contract. Amend means fix, change. Everybody with me on that? How about if we wanted to change the closing date, the purchase price, the amount of the seller paid closing costs, the fact that the seller was going to provide a home warranty, the fact that the seller was going to fix something. Those are a lot of changes to make with amendments. That is a mess if you start trying. And there you go. So what is the natural common sense approach to if you want to change all of that about the contract, what should you do? Start over and write a new contract. That is called a novation. A novation, nova means new. A novation simply means put a new contract in place of an old contract. So here's the thing that's not changing. and You need to understand this about a novation. The parties have not changed. The buyer is still the same buyer. The seller is still the same seller. The property is still the same property. But all of the other terms may have changed. And we're simply going to take that new agreement and put it in place of the old agreement. We're simply saying you don't have to live up to these promises because we've replaced them with these promises. That is a novation. And so you would do that when you're making a bunch of changes to a contract that's already in place. Because think about it, could I go through and put one line through everything that I was changing and have everybody initial and date the changes? I could do that. Sure, I could. But the question is not what I can do, the question is would I want to? Think about what that contract would look like if I had to go through and change the purchase price, the closing date, the amount of the seller paid closing costs, the fact that they were having a home warranty. Every page would have lines through stuff and initials and dates and it would become very complex to read and figure out what the heck was actually intended by that document. Does that make sense? So the thing that would be more sensible would be an ovation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So I have like a real question. Um, okay. So a friend of mine, um, back when in 2006, I met him in college. He moved to California where he on, came back, now he works in um, Charlotte, and the other day he posted something about that he bought a house, and I was there and I realized we were staying. A message came back and said, I realized we were staying in um, And he said, um, I have it under contract and I'm going to flip this one. And then I responded, I was like, oh, okay, are you living in it once you're finished? And 
finish flipping or are you going to lease the sign? He said, well, I'm actually going to assign it to, assign the contract to an actual rehabber, then I'll be done with the rents for he. I might have one tomorrow and I'll be getting two. So for example, on this one, I'll probably just assign it for five or ten k more than I got it for the difference. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, I know we don't really go into a lot of detail about assignments and whatnot, but like, well, I was trying to like, I was, and then I was thinking about it, trying to recall, you know, from the last class. And then I get really sticky. Like I was just thinking about it, and I was like, so let's talk about what he's doing. It's called whole. It's it's called wholesaling. It's called wholesaling. Yeah. It's called wholesaling. Here's what he did. He went to some seminar on a Saturday morning from <laughs> some snake oil salesman who sold him a get rich quick scheme. And that get rich quick scheme will work great until it doesn't. And here's what's going to happen when it doesn't. He's going to be stuck having to buy one of these houses. Yeah. And he's not going to have the money to buy one of these houses, and he's going to get sued. Yeah. And all that five or $10,000 that he's made on each one along the way, guess what's going to happen when he gets sued because he was fraudulently engaging in these transactions? It's going to evaporate because that person suing him is going to win 10 times what he made yeah. on all these things. I'm just telling you what's yeah, coming. Yeah, I, I like so here, here's the underlying idea of what he's trying to accomplish, or what he's doing. What was he doing? He, he, he is wholesaling. So what he is doing is going and making an offer to purchase a property from someone, having them agree to that offer to purchase, and so they're under contract. The particular contract he is having that person sign, and I would imagine he is uh, doing this without benefit of a real estate broker on either side of the transaction. Not only does he not have representation, not, neither do the sellers, because anybody who was representing a seller in this case would say, uh, no. Yeah. And so he is going to a seller who presumably doesn't know the value of their property, making an offer to purchase their property, and saying, I'll pay you cash, which is a lot, because he never intends to pay cash, because most likely he doesn't have the cash to pay. See, right there is the fraud involved in this situation. Most likely, now maybe he does have the money. I highly doubt it. Maybe he does. I doubt it. But I'll pay you cash. What he's not telling them is that he never intends to buy their property at all, because the contract he has drafted with them probably has some paragraph in there about the assignability of the contract. And it probably gives the buyer the unilateral, what does unilateral mean? One-sided, right? The unilateral right to assign the contract to another buyer of their choosing. So what he will do is immediately begin to market that property before he actually purchases it. Which is most likely also in the contract that he's having this seller sign. Permission to market the property. So what he's going to do, he's going to offer Christina $150,000 on her property. Cash. Cash. And Christina has no idea what her property is worth, so she agrees to this contract. She doesn't read it because people don't read things. I mean, why would you want to read something like a sales contract for your biggest investment? I don't know why you would bother to read such a thing, but she doesn't, like most Americans or morons when it comes to such a thing. That's why they need us, by the way, um, which means you better read it, right? But she doesn't read it. She signs it. And what it says in there is that this buyer has a unilateral right to assign that contract. So let's talk about what an assignment is. An assignment is changing one of the parties to the contract. You're not changing the agreement, you're simply changing what? The people, the parties. And in this case, what party would be changing? Christina's not going to change, she's still the seller. What party would be changing? The buyer. So what this buyer is going to do is start to market Christina's property. So let's say he's gone under contract with Christina and the contract calls for a closing of October 31st, roughly, okay? October 31st, we're gonna close. So Christina goes about her life. She knows she's got her house sold, she's gonna move out, she's selling the house on October 31st. 
Well, she comes home from work the next day and she notices a for sale sign sitting in the front yard. And she's like, well, what is this? And so she calls the guy because it's his name and number. The guy who's buying her house, it's his name and number on the for sale sign sitting in the front yard. And she says, why is there a for sale sign? He said, because I'm trying to sell the house. She said, you don't even own the house. He said, no. But the contract you signed gives me the right to go ahead and try to sell it even before I own it. And now, how much is he paying Christina for the house? $150,000. He's asking $175,000 for the house. And so he brings a buyer in and he shows the buyer around the property and the buyer makes an offer of $170,000. Now he can't sell something he does not own. But what he does have is a contract that gives him the right to do what? To assign, to change parties. So what he's going to do when buyer Omar comes along and offers that $170,000, he's going to take his name off of the sales contract and put whose name on? Omar. Omar's. Now, Omar now has a contract to purchase the property for how much money? Uh-uh. $150,000 because nothing changed about the sales contract. Where does the other $20,000 go? To the middleman who just walked out the door. He gets it up front, probably. Most likely, he will structure it such that Omar will pay him $20,000 as a non-refundable deposit and then the balance will be paid at closing. Well, the balance is actually the whole what? Oh, no. The whole purchase price of $150,000. So he's, yeah, is, it legal? is it legal? Yes. Uh, I mean, there's so many. It is legal because, in theory, these are two consumers, neither of whom is licensed, so they sh they're on an equal playing field. That's the legal theory about it. Would it be legal for a real estate broker to be involved in such a scheme? Absolutely not. Because see, one of the things, remember we talked about material facts. We said one of the material facts we have to disclose is the intent of our client to resell the property for what? For a profit. So I, I'm not saying a real estate broker couldn't be involved in an assignment contract. They certainly could. But what's the first thing I would have to say to Christina if I was the one negotiating that deal? I represent a buyer, and what does that buyer intend to do? If they not even just flip it. They intend to literally put it on the market for more money than they're paying you for. What is the what is the seller most likely to say when I give her that warning? Uh, no, if you're going to sell it for more, you can pay me more for it. Does that make sense? The problem with, and I'm not trying to pick on your friend here, I'm just, you know, you know. The problem with that sort of a system is that in most cases the seller is never aware of what they've actually agreed to until they're already under contract with it. All these signs that you say that we buy houses, you know, we buy uglyhouses.com, we pay cash for houses, that is, the, the, those people are not actually buying these houses in most cases. What they're doing is simply trying to put contracts in place and then essentially selling the contract. Because another way to look at it is, he's not selling a house, what is he selling? He's selling a contract. He's selling the right to buy her house for how much money? 150. And how much is he charging for the contract? Twenty thousand dollars. What if he backs out? Well, if he backs up, it's no skin off the middleman's teeth because the middleman with an assignment. What happens to the original party on an assignment? They go away. We switched them out. So all the legal responsibility falls to who? The new buyer. And if the new buyer doesn't go through with it, oh well. And who still got their money? The middleman did. Okay. You know they're teaching this class at ENC State. Oh, they do. They all over the place. And that's the thing. This, this is not illegal. It's unethical, in my opinion. So but that's my opinion. Wouldn't this just create, I mean, in the long run, wouldn't that create a lot of title issues? I mean, it could create a title issue, but most likely not. Because if you think about it, the title's only going to transfer how many times? Once. 
Of course. I mean, but it, I just, this just seems Basically, have to take advantage of people to. It, it, the, whole, the whole system is predicated on the idea that the original seller does not know what. What their properties were. They're, exactly. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, for example, there is a local, there's a real estate firm that operates around the country now that does this essentially as a real estate firm. Now, they don't do it as assignment contracts. They actually buy it and then they resell it. And here's how they market themselves. I'm not picking on them. I find it distasteful, but it's not illegal. They market themselves as you don't have to worry about putting your house on the market. You don't have to worry about having showings. You don't have to worry. Just go on our website. And you'll have an offer in 10 minutes on your house. It, it's, it, within 48 hours, you got an offer, and we'll pay cash, and you can pick the closing date. And all of that is true. But they're only doing it because they know they're buying it for a price that they can do what? Sell it and make a profit on it. Open door. Yeah. Here's the ugly truth about it. You want to hear the really ugly truth about it. They come in and they make you that offer, right? And then the fine print of that contract says that they're going to charge you a 6% fee. I wonder why 6%. <laughs> they are what, after all? A real estate firm. They charge a 6% fee on top of the other. out of what they pay you for the property. So if they've offered you $200,000, you're not going to see $200,000. You're going to see $188,000 because they're going to take $12,000 in fees off the top of it. Yes. Who doing that? Yes. Talk about that or double that. And, and so... When people ask me, well, what do I think of that business model? I said, well, I think you'd have to be desperate to sell to them. You basically turn the real estate business into a car business. That's exactly right. Because what they're, and, and listen, if they are being upfront and honest with the seller, then more power to them. But what they should be saying to the seller is, you understand what we're going to do with your house. You understand that we're going to resell your house. Because the first time you tell me as a consumer, now, you wouldn't have to tell me because I know what their business model is. But as a consumer, if you tell me, well, we're going to buy your house from you and then we're going to immediately put it up for sale for more money than we paid you for it, what would you say? I'd be like, well, damn, if I need to sell it to you, I just need to put it on the market myself, right? You know, clearly if there's that much money to be made. And so here's what I tell people that ask me about them. I say, how much is it worth to you to have to deal with the headache of putting your house on the market? Because it is a headache. But what I'll tell you is on the average property, they probably turn a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 profit. So that's twenty-five dollars to $30,000 that is not in the seller's pocket, but is in their pocket. So is it, and that's what I ask people, I say, is it worth the twenty-five dollars or $30,000 to you not to have to, yeah, I realize it was very convenient. You got an offer in 48 hours. I think I could wait a month for an offer for twenty-five grand. I don't know about y'all, you know. There you go. <laughs> you think there'll be some kind of consumer action oh. against these kind of people at some point in time? Well, I think um, in the in the case of uh, Open Door, I really think it's going to center around, and I'm not picking on them, anybody that does that kind of a marketing push, um, I think it's going to ultimately center around, are they, because they're real estate brokers and because they therefore have to disclose material facts, are they being very clear and upfront with the sellers of the property that we intend to resell your property? for a profit. Um, I would assume they probably have it buried in some paperwork somewhere along the way. I, what hasn't been tested yet is, is does that really meet the legal requirement? What it's probably going to take is some seller suing them and us to get a judgment one way or another to figure out if that if they actually complied with the legal requirement of a real estate broker to, to you know to say we plan to resell your property for a profit. Somebody would do that out of like convenience. Because I, when I think about like a situation like that, I think about watching that show Pawn Stars on my YouTube channel. Somebody goes in Absolutely. with, with a coin worth ten grand. Right. Like, well, I'll take five. I'll I take feel like going on twenty five hundred dollars, right? Because yeah, they need it right now. Yeah, because I don't feel like putting on the market. It'll take, right. It'll take thirty minutes, and I don't have that kind of time. Exactly. And so there are people who are completely willing to eat that loss for the convenience, and for them, that business model is a good fit. 
And, I, and that's why I say I got no problem with the business model. I just want to make sure that they are being upfront with people about what's happening. Okay? So typically, when people get yeah. in trouble for this, it's typically because they're trying to get their business model well and that's the and that's the and that's the real rub here is is your friend are they doing it for themselves or are they doing it for someone other than themselves if they're doing it for someone other than themselves and clearly they need a real estate license to be involved in it because because ostensibly your friend is the buyer he's doing it for himself but what he may find is that he may want to create something like an LLC so that he takes some of the risk away from himself. Well, once he creates an LLC, he's no longer doing it for himself. He's doing it for what? For others. So that would trigger the need for what? A real estate license. And so um, he will have to be very careful to avoid triggering the licensure requirement. So, he is. There's no doubt. It is playing on the very outside fringe edge of what is permissible. Um, and the truth is, here's the blunt truth. The vast majority of those contracts that are being used for stuff like that, the ones I've seen look like they were written by a five-year-old. Yeah, the one that like, he like posted a picture, I mean, it literally just looked like, I mean, like a worksheet. You would, I mean, not saying anything about right. like worksheets, but it was just like a plainly typed out, like, yeah. you know, Right. And so the question is, is that was that drafted by an attorney? Does it comply with North Carolina law? For, and so again, he, what he may run the risk of is, and, and here's the way the law works. If you draft the contract and there's any dispute around it, then they hold you responsible as the one who drafted it. You take the hit. So if, for example, Christina finds out this is what's going on and she sues, she pushes back against this, this assignment buyer, and says, no, that's not what we agreed to, yada, 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 and she sues, and it ends up in court, and it turns out that the, the assignment buyer drafted the contract themselves, and then there's some discrepancy with it, the judge is going to hammer them because they're the ones who drafted the contract language. And so there's a, there's a significant amount of risk there, and I'm sure he's not accounting for that risk. I didn't want to like give advice. Yeah, I, I would. I, I mean, I, no, right. I just, like, I well, it's like most things. The shortcut may work for a while yeah. until it does. Until it, now, I will tell you, I had a, one of my best friends got caught up in this and thought, without even meaning to in uh, Arizona. Uh, he started doing assignment contracts in the last housing boom. This always happens in a housing boom. And I'll tell you how Adam got caught up in it. He was, a, he was drafted by the Cubs in the ninth round of the Major League Baseball draft. And so he had some money because he had a signing bonus. And he wanted to buy a house out in Arizona where the Cubs spring training complex was. He went out there. He signed a contract to buy a new construction house. And two days before closing, he was doing a final walkthrough with the builder. And as he came out of the house with the builder from the walkthrough, car pulled up on the curb. person got out, introduced himself, and said, I'd like to buy your house. And Adam said, well, it's not my house yet. And, the, and the, the guy said, I understand that. I'd like to buy it anyway. I'll pay you $40,000 right now in addition to what you're paying for the house. I'll pay for the house. I'll buy the house. And I'll pay you $40,000. What would you do if somebody gave, gave you that offer? Take the money and run. And the reason this person was willing to do that is because what had happened was property values were going up so fast in the Phoenix area at that point in time that it had been almost a year since Adam had signed the contract to build this house, and the house was now worth way more than what he had contracted to purchase it for. Does that make sense for everybody? So this buyer was willing to do that. Well, when you do that one time, do all of a sudden you think you have invented, you know, your new career, right? So. He thought his side business was going to be doing assignment contracts on houses. And he successfully did, I don't know, five or six of them. But when the bottom fell out, he got stuck on in three houses. And combined, he was invested in those three for about a million four. He sold them for a total of $900,000 because prices had collapsed so much. That's the risk you run 
when the rug gets pulled out. That's the that's the thing. Are we all good on an assignment? Okay. So an assignment, a novation is. I got a big clicker. I keep hitting the wrong button. Hold on, I'll go back. Um, a novation is changing what? Changing term, but but or but making a bunch of changes. Making a bunch of changes. So instead of just making individual changes, what are we doing? Replacing a whole new contract. The whole contract. Is, what stays the same? There's only one thing that stays the same when you do a novation. The people, the parties stay the same. Is everybody good with that? Whereas with an assignment, the contract, the agreement stays the same, but what changes? The people, one of the parties. Usually the buyer. Usually the buyer. Could we also do an assignment in leases, for example? Sure. Especially in commercial leases. If you go out and lease commercial property, very often you might lease it for five, seven years. What if your business fails in year three? Might you need to find somebody to take over your lease? Well, what you would actually be doing is assigning that lease because you would be taking your name off and putting somebody else's name on. Does that make sense? That's an assignment as well. Okay? So changing the parties is called an assignment. Discharging or ending a contract. It's all about performance when it comes to a contract. I put this slide up one time. Somebody said this looks like an erectile dysfunction ad right here. Full performance, partial performance. God forbid you get to impossibility of performance, right? <laughs> But contracts are all about performance. Have you fully performed all the promises? That's full performance, and that would end a contract. The truth is, all of these would end a contract, even something like partial performance. If you get two parties that have largely done everything they promised to do, but there's still some sticking point, a court of law could say, you're done. You have substantially performed, you've done enough, and the contract's over. Does that make sense? Or a lot do anything they want to do. Uh, mutual agreement is the biggest way other than performance. Full performance or closing is the best way. Second best way would be mutual agreement. You need a mutual agreement to terminate most contracts, most sales contracts. Both parties need to agree. And of course, operation of law just means a court of law would end it. Sometimes contracts do not get discharged in a uh, positive manner. Sometimes contracts end under less than advantageous terms. Sometimes we have breaches of contracts. And when we have breaches, we have damages. A breach creates damage. Think of a ship. Like we said, the, the, the ship's hull has a breach. It needs to be what? It needs to be fixed. you got to repair it. There's got to be a fix. We call that a remedy. In contractual terms, the repair for a breach is called a remedy. The remedy is damages. It's how we fix it when you don't live up to your end of a bargain in a contract what exactly you have to do to make it better that you have breached this contract. Is that making sense for everybody? Okay. So a remedy or damages are the result of somebody breaching a contract. If any party to a contract breaches, they're probably going to have some liability to the other party. Otherwise, what would be the point of having a contract? If you could just breach and there was no penalty, it wouldn't be much of a contract. So you need to know the different types of remedies, what they are, what they're called, and when they apply. The first type is called compensatory damages. And why do we have this lovely young lady's picture up here? Because this is where damages are decided. Where? In a court of law. Compensatory damages. The root word here is compensate. So you are compensating the other person for their loss. 
you're not paying them for imaginary stuff. You're not paying them for stuff that they just claim, oh, by pain and suffering. You're paying them for things that actually have a dollar sign attached to them. If you sideswipe somebody's car and do $12,000 worth of damage, and they sue you for compensatory damages, how much are they suing you for? How much? $12,000. Because compensatory damages is only meant to pay for the actual monetary loss. It's not a punishment, folks. It's not meant to be a punishment. If they did $12,000 worth of damage to your car and you sue them for compensatory damages, you're suing them for $12,000. Because that is the harm they did to you by hitting your car. And that's all the harm they did to you by hitting your car if you're asking for compensatory damages. Does that make sense? It's none of this nonsense malarkey of, well, I, you know, I can't even, I, I'm traumatized, I can't even look in a parking lot anymore. Because there's no dollar amount associated with that. You, under, you understand where I'm coming from? Compensatory damages is not meant to fix any of that. Compensatory damages is very much about, for example, if you were suing somebody because they hit you in a car accident, and you wanted compensatory damages. Give me examples of things you might be asking for for them to compensate you for. What kinds of things could you ask them to compensate you for that have a real dollar amount attached to them? Hospital bills. Hospital bills. It cost me $42,000 to go to the doctor because you, you rear-ended me. I want you to compensate me for that money. What else? What might I miss? Work. I get paid $70 an hour, $20 an hour, whatever that amount is, and I missed 100 hours of work. I want you to compensate me. Is that a real dollar amount? Yes. Absolutely. The damage to my car, is that a real dollar amount? Yes. No question. All, I had to rent a rental car for six weeks, and it cost me, you know, $800 to rent the rental car. Is that a real compensatory amount? Those would be all the things you would be suing for for compensatory damages. We could also, in addition, ask for something called consequential damages. Consequential damages are very different than compensatory. All that nonsense stuff that I laughed at before becomes real serious now. This is the, oh, Oh, my back. He's yeah, ill, right? My neck and my back. <laughs> I want 150000 for my pain and suffering. You have traumatized me for life. I can't even go outside anymore. I want $37 million because I had to smell the hog farm down the road. That in the news lately? Yeah. Is that compensatory or is that consequential? consequential. It's consequential. There's no way. And I, listen, I'm not defending Smithfield Foods at all here, but I'm saying you have to understand could, if it was compensatory, what kinds of compensatory damages could those plaintiffs have sued for in that case? What would what would they have to con what would they be con How about if they were trying to sell their house and they had to sell it for $150,000 less because of the smell? Could they sue for the $150,000? That would be compensatory. But they didn't get 150000 They got $78 million or whatever it was. What is that? That's consequential damages. So compensatory essentially is going to have a receipt or an invoice. Perfect. Exactly. To when, when, if you go watch this lady on television, when she asked for the receipt, we're talking about compensatory damages. Okay. When you start talking about how much pain and suffering and anguish and agony and Oh my God, I can't even function anymore. See, there's no receipt for any of that. But, but you're asking a judge or a jury to put a number on it for you, that's consequential damages. So, but I mean, uh, and does that extend it to, you know, I 
I had functional legs, now I no longer have functional legs, so I used to be a UPS driver, now I can no longer do that. Absolutely. That and so, you know, I estimate that over the course of my lifetime, you will have cost me $2 million worth of, because I can't give you a receipt and show, I can give you a receipt and show that I missed this much work up to this point. And that would be compensatory, but consequential would be guessing into the future. Okay. Does that make sense? That's a really good example. So you, the way you put it is exactly right. If you got a receipt for it, it's compensatory. If you're asking them to just put a number on it, it's consequential. Everybody all right with that? Now, one last type of lawsuit you need to be familiar with in a real estate class, especially, is this last one down here. By the way, these are all lawsuits. There's no way to get compensatory damages or consequential damages unless you sue. This last one down here is a very specific type of lawsuit. Specific performance. Way back in chapter one, we said that every piece of land is what? Unique from every other piece of land. If a seller tries to back out of a sales contract, and the buyer wants to move forward, the buyer can sue the seller for something called specific performance. They are asking the court to force the seller to do what? Sell, Sell them the property. I don't want money. I don't want damages. I want what? I want the property because nothing in the world, there's not any amount of money in the world you can give me that will replace this piece of property. That's a lawsuit for specific performance. It, here's the thing. It only works one way. Notice what it says. It says, who is suing who? Buyer. Buyer is suing a seller. It does not work from the other perspective. This is the good thing about this new place. Look how bright my little light is now. I just have to get used to where the buttons are on it. You know, you use the same one for so long, and these buttons are in different places. So I keep getting the wrong button. But it's a buyer suing a seller. When you talk about specific performance, now all of these are damages that come from lawsuits. Everybody good with that? There's one type of damages though that doesn't require a lawsuit. This is what makes it so special because it avoids going where? Court. To court. Thank God. Stay out of court. That should be your goal for your whole career as a real estate broker. Stay out of court. You want your contracts in a perfect world as a real estate broker to always include something called liquidated damages. Liquid, not consequential, not compensatory, but liquidated. Because liquidated damages are designed to avoid ending up where? In court. Here's the thing. Why do you have to go to court to get damages in the first place? Because you need somebody to do what? Make a decision. You need somebody to make a call and say how much the damages are. Does that make sense? And you can't rely on the two parties to agree to that because they're clearly not in agreement with each other. They're, they have, they breached the contract. Is everybody following me on that? So we end up in court. We're asking a judge to decide how much the damages are. What if the two parties agree in advance. If I mess up, I will give you this much money. If you mess up, you will give me this much money. And here's a deal I'll make with you. You promise you give me that money, and I promise I won't sue you for more. Our, our damages will be what? liquidated. Our damages will be liquidated. They will be gone. Because we've agreed in advance that Omar breaching this contract is worth $5,000. We've agreed in advance. We put it right in the contract. We said, if I breach this contract, I'll pay you $5,000. But you agree not to do what? Not to sue me. I will give you the money, no questions asked. You're not going to sue me, and you're not going to have the right to sue me for more. So you better be satisfied with that amount. That's liquidated damages. Why is that wonderful from our perspective as real estate brokers? Because we don't have to go to court. There's no dispute about it. So here's what I'm going to tell you. 
why this is so important. In most real estate sales contracts, the earnest money deposit serves as liquidated damages. We talked about an earnest money deposit. We said that purpose was to make sure the buyer was what? Serious. That they meant it. That they were going to go through with it. So, Omar is buying a house for me. He's paying me $300,000 for the house. And in that contract, he's paid a $10,000 earnest money deposit. Now, that money's not coming to me right away. It's going to a trust account. But the understanding is that if Omar, for any reason, doesn't purchase my property, what will happen to that $10,000? It will be forfeited over to me, the seller, as what kind of damages? Liquidated damages. That means I'll get the ten grand, and I don't have the right to do what? To sue for any more. And the beauty of that, from our perspective, is it makes it clean. It makes it over with. Because now, what, no matter whether I'm on the listing side or I'm on the selling side, if I'm, if if, if Teresa is Omar's real estate broker. How can she explain? When he comes to her and says, listen, I think I'm going to back out. I don't think I'm going to buy this house. What's she going to say to him? You're going to lose what money? How much? $5,000. $10,000, right? $10,000. You're going to lose your earnest money deposit. $10,000. So how does she know that's the amount? Because that's the what? That's the earnest money deposit. Does she need to wait for a court to decide it? No. Why? It's already written in the contract. The two parties decided when they went under contract. So when he comes to her and says, what should I do? She said, well, you need to decide. Do you want to close or do you want to forfeit $10,000? It becomes very cut and dry. Because if we didn't have liquidated damages there, what would she have to explain to him? If the contract didn't call for liquidated damages, what could I, the seller, do if he backed out? Sue so, so him for what? Uh, Compensatory damages. What else? Consequential damages. Couldn't I sue? I could sue him and say, you know what? I had a job making three million dollars a year in California, and I had to turn that job down because now I have to stay here and sell my house again. Is that a threat? I mean, I could potentially sue him for that, right? So, which job is easier for her? Just to look at him and say, well, if you back out, you're going to lose your ten thousand dollars. Or if you back out, you run the risk of the, the seller suing you, and we really don't know what that could cost you because a judge would have to decide how much damage you had done to the seller as a result of backing out. and You might lose everything you own. Which sounds cleaner to you? Earnest money. Earnest money. Liquidated damages. Does that make sense for everybody? And that's why liquidated damages is our friend as a real estate broker. We love contracts that call for liquidated damages because it makes the outcome very clear. It makes it very clear. The advantage is we don't have to go where? Court. To court. It avoids court. It's designed to avoid court, even when there's a breach. Makes sense for everybody? Go ahead. Can you give us a, a possible a scenario to test the question these different types of um, can I give a scenario of a test question with you? Generally speaking, they're, they're, they're going to want, they want you just to identify, you know, you know which, so they might say something like, um, uh, Trudy has entered into uh, an agreement with another party, um, and as a result of her breach of the agreement, she is sued for the actual monetary damages incurred by the other party as a result of her breach. This is an example of. She is sued for the actual monetary damages. What kind of damages are those? Those are compensatory damages. Trudy has entered into a contract with another party and she is currently being sued for damages that include those uh, that are actual in nature and possible as they relate to her actions and her breach. This is an example of what? Consequential damages. Trudy has entered into a sales contract um, and breached that contract with the knowledge that she will forfeit a certain sum of funds 
to the other party in the event of her breach. This is an example of what? Liquidated damages. That, that's the best way I can think of it. Yeah. Everybody okay with that? Well, sue automatically eliminates liquidated, right? You know, anytime it talks about lawsuit, you look, you eliminated liquidated. You're talking about compensatory or consequential. Good. Good. And last slide we've got in this chapter, and it's something we have talked about plenty already. Be careful of this on a test. Don't draft language. Don't do it because you want to do it. Don't do it because your client tells you to do it. Don't do it because your big said it was okay to do it. It's never okay to draft contract language. It is okay to fill in the blanks on a pre-printed form, but it is never okay to write in contract language, draft contract language, you know, come up with explicit contract language, put lines through contract language and make changes to it. None of that is allowable unless you're what? An attorney. That's all considered the practice of law. So be very careful that they're going to test you on that. Because that's also one of the biggest complaints that the Real Estate Commission routinely gets. Trust me, you do not want to get a cease and desist letter from the North Carolina Bar Association. Because that's what's going to happen. If the Real Estate Commission gets a complaint that you're drafting time guide language, you're going to go through the disciplinary process over there, and then they're required by law to report that to the North Carolina Bar Association. And then you're going to get a certified letter from the North Carolina Bar Association that says, you know, it, uh, Mr. Taylor, it has come to, the, come to the attention of the North Carolina Bar Association that you, a licensed real estate broker in the state of North Carolina, are unlawfully engaging in the practice of law. You are hereby notified this is a Class A felony under North Carolina General Statute, blah, 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 blah. Should you continue to engage in this activity, we will prosecute you to the fullest extent. I mean, that's a scary-ass letter to get, right? You don't want to get that from the North Carolina Bar, so, and they will send it to you. I've seen people get them. So don't draft language. Don't write stuff in the margins. Don't write stuff. You usually use, you know, you may change to have, like, say you have a friend who's Closing attorney. Remember, every transaction is going to have a closing attorney, right? They've already been paid. They've already been engaged in the transaction. They are the best source to have changes, those kinds of changes made. Just contact them. Let them know what you're trying to accomplish and say, I need language that accomplishes that. And they'll send it to you. Now, are they going to probably bill for it? Sure. They're going to, and, and, I, and I pass that on to the client because I'm going to say to the client, we can get this language put in here for you. I can't do it, an attorney has to, and they don't work for free. So do you want me to find out how much they would charge us to draft language that would do that? And they'll either say yes or no. Sometimes they're just like, ah, oh, I didn't have to do deal. Sometimes they say, yeah, I really want it in there. You know, it usually costs a couple hundred bucks. Now, here's what I do. I have a really good working relationship with most of the closing attorneys I work with. And I've gotten their permission over the years to say, listen, if we pay you for language for a specific thing one time, can I use that language if that same situation ever comes up again? And they've all always said, that's fine. So what I do is I just keep it in a file. I have a file on my computer, you know, on my, on my cloud drive. I have a file that says attorney drafted language. And I just name each folder based on what the situation was. Okay, well, this one was when we wanted to insert an appraisal contingency into the contract. So I go in there and I look, and here's a Word file with the language that the attorney created, and I can just cut and paste it the next time. Because if the question ever came, and I keep documentation of what attorney drafted it when it was drafted, so that way if the question ever comes back, who drafted this language, I would say, here's the attorney who drafted it, here's when it was drafted, you know, that sort of thing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. It just has to be drafted by an attorney. Because if you think about it, you don't have to rewrite, get a new sales contract every time. You're recycling one that was previously drafted. The key was it was drafted by who? An attorney. So um, you're fine to fill in blanks, but that's it. That's all. That's all we can do is fill in the blanks. No, and it's tempting. It's easy for me to, it's easy 
to hear it right now, you go, oh, I would never do that. Yes, you will. You'll be very tempted at the very least because your client's standing there breathing over your neck. You're like, now nah, I'm going to mark that out. And, 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 I, and I hand it to him, I say, there you go. Now I want you to make that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you do it. Well, I don't know how to do it. That makes two of us because I'm not an attorney. Oh, they're very demanding. Very demanding about stuff like that. You know, and what I always try to remind them is it's actually the worst possible scenario for me to draft that language for you. Because if I mess it up, you're going to be in a worse legal position than you were before we even tried to put the language in there. You know? So let's do it right. Get an attorney to draft it. That way we've got some legal recourse if this thing goes badly. Because my guess is if you've got a client who wants a bunch of special language inserted in there, they're probably of the high maintenance variety who might be more inclined to sue you anyway. So that's the ones you really need to watch out for. You know? And I tell them, and I've told clients like that before. I've said, listen, we have pre-printed contracts for a reason. They're meant to be used as is. If you want a specialized contract, we can do that, but it costs money because we have to pay an attorney to write you a specialized contract. And most of the time they find it's going to cost them money. You know what they say? Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then that's it, which is great, because that's what I wanted anyway. Leave me alone. <laughs> don't, I don't want to do that. But make sure you don't draft language. And that is it for our basic contract law. And gosh, you got here eight minutes early. I don't know what you're going to do with yourself. So, all right, so for tomorrow, tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow, we will cover chapter 10, uh, which is sales contracts, and we will probably round out the day with some more license law, the license law and rules. We will. I'm not going to start uh, chapter 11 because uh, midterm only goes through chapter 10, so I'm not going to necessarily start on chapter 11 um, yet. So plan to finish chapter 10 tomorrow and then do some license law and rules, and you will take your midterm home with you tomorrow. Um, to have for homework this week. Okay? See you tomorrow, guys.